Hello, everybody. It's a very exciting day to be back up on the stage at FIRE, something I look forward to every year. The last three years, uh, we have had a conversation around grid computing. And uh, last year, we decided to retire that topic and move on to something more interesting. What we're going to talk about today is a number of applications based on high-performance computing, high-speed networking, and visualization. With me today is Larry Smarr. Welcome, Larry. Thanks. Larry is the past director of the NCSA, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. He is the current director of Cal IT2 at uh, UC San Diego and, and a number of other locations. How many other locations are there? San Diego and Irvine are the two main. The two main locations. At, uh, at the center at Cal IT2, Larry acts as the principal investigator for a number of interesting projects, one being the Optiputer, another being the Lambda Grid, and something that you may have read about in, in an SNS special letter recently, the camera project. And uh, we'll define all of those as we go over the next uh, 27 minutes or so. In, as I said earlier, we, we spoke about GRID last year. Uh, and, and in that conversation, we talked about the best effort net. And uh, Larry talked about some things called data caves, the, uh, the lack of broadband that we were all lamenting up until, I guess, last night when we all changed our views on that. One thing that we are going to talk about today is, is something Mark mentioned earlier, is that this conversation over the next half hour or so is going to be all about the sharp end of the spear. Everything that Larry is doing in his lab at Cal IT2 is very leading edge. The visualization, the high-speed networking, the computer based on a, a widely globally distributed network of, of interconnected computers. Uh, last year, we started to talk about the cyber infrastructure. And that's sort of where we're going to pick it up again this year. So Larry, can you give us some kind of update on the cyber infrastructure, including definitions of the three projects that I mentioned? Well, cyber infrastructure is a very broad term that was developed, I think, intentionally, uh, not called the grid or the web, uh, to mean the uh, high-speed network connected set of resources worldwide, computers, storage, instruments, people, uh, and the middleware that goes between the networks and the applications. Now, the big news since uh, we met last here at FIRE is that the National Science Foundation has opened an office of cyber infrastructure directly off the director's office. So rather than be in one of the um, directorates, including the computer science directorate, uh, this is a, uh, uh, meant to be across uh, the entire NSF. And that's because the NSF is rolling out um, billions of dollars in large-scale shared scientific infrastructure over the next 10 or 15 years building a whole new generation of undersea observatories, uh, new astronomical observatories, uh, uh, national e environmental observatories, uh, and so forth. All of these require the same shared infrastructure, cyber infrastructure, beneath the layer at which it customizes to be a radio telescope or an optical telescope or an undersea uh, remote uh, piloted vehicle, uh, and yet that robust cyber infrastructure in a way doesn't exist yet. What we have instead are 10 to 15 years of research, primarily in the academic world, and <clears throat> development of things like web services out of the corporate side, and these are merging together. Um, to try to understand how to underpin these vast new um, observatories. To give you an example, on the President's budget, $300 million is uh, there for what's called Orion, which is for interactive, that's the I in Orion, uh, ocean observatories. Um, these, for instance, take the uh, telecom electro-optic cables that we've had uh, under the sea uh, to handle telephone calls, I guess, well, it, they weren't fiber, but if you go back 100 and something years ago when the first transatlantic cable was laid until now, um, and reposition those for science to actually go out along uh, a large um, part of the continental plate actually off of Washington and Canada, uh, that's what the Neptune project is, um, there will be um, 
many, many hundreds of miles of this cable, and then at the nodes, you will have the ability to have robots going out, uh, have uh, lights, uh, chemical sensors, physical sensors, seismic sensors, eventually biological sensors. So the data will be coming back, but it, look, it's coming back over fiber. So it's coming back at gigabits per second. And so when it hits the mainland, <laughs> you'd like to see these clear channel gigabit, 10 gigabit paths directly to the end users. That's what's coming up since we last met here in the National Lambda Rail in the United States. That connects the 20 largest cities with um, uh, fiber that has been uh, leased from the carriers. Uh, and then in each fiber, you can of course have these multiple uh, paths, light paths, uh, commercially now as many as 40, but eventually maybe as many as 1,000, each of which is gigabits per second. Now imagine dedicating those to an individual. So I know you think that broadband's over, and Mark, I hear you say that. Broadband, we do not have broadband. We aren't gonna have broadband for quite a while yet. Uh, <clears throat> broadband, right now to me, means 10 gigabits a second. Uh, that's what the backbone of, say, Internet 2 is. But it's shared. And so across the Internet 2, connecting the 200 largest research universities, maybe you can get 20, maybe 50 megabits per second on a good day out of 10,000 megabits per second. Now imagine, though, that you could just have that all for yourself. And that's what's been established now in the National Lambda Rail and internationally connecting many of the leading research universities um, around the world uh, in what's called the Global Lambda Integrated Facility, or GLIF. And in September, we just held a, sort of a global Woodstock uh, for applications of this kind of super bandwidth at our new uh, facility at UC San Diego, the one you'll be visiting tonight, actually, those of you who go on the tour. Uh, we had 24 countries show up, do 50 demonstrations, each one of which used this gigabit per second, which is roughly 500 times the bandwidth that you have to your home if you have DSL or cable. Now, a factor of 500 gap means that we do not have broadband. When we get gigabit to the home, you'll have broadband. And you do see some of the carriers like Verizon um, talking about actually not just doing fiber to the curb, but uh, delivering that gigabit to individual homes in the next 10 years. So do you see this as a, a move from PCs to personal circuits, or is that just too far out into the future? No, I think that's the way to the way to go. Uh, George Gilder really actually influenced my thinking a lot on this, and although he wasn't as accurate with stock picks as you would like, um, I think his basic philosophy uh, was ac absolutely prophetic. Um, you know, he wrote a lot about the increase in computing during the 80s, and that how the companies that won were the ones that learned to waste transistors. Um, because every year there was going to be double as much power as there was the year before. So if you got out ahead of the curve and started thinking about, well, gee, if I had all this bandwidth, all this uh, computing, what would I do? Well, when, band when computing was scarce, we all lived together on the same computer called a mainframe. And as you remember, when you took your deck of cards, that dates me, uh, to the high priest that sat in front of the machine, you had no idea when your code would come back, you know? It was completely unpredictable because there were all these other people on the machine. That's the way we are with the internet today. It's very unpredictable because of the nature of the internet. Whenever you send a signal out, it packetizes and kachinkos them around uh, through the world. And then so the same exact message every time will take a different amount of, of, of uh, a different latency. Well, it's not the glasses fault. It's the fact that we're in this shared environment. Now, when the the computing exponential continued through the point that personal computers became affordable, and everybody got them. We went to the state you have today. Your, your personal computers are idle 92% of the time, 95% of the time. If a mainframe was idle 10% of the time, you were fired. Now, how is it that, that both can be true? 
and it's because of this exponential. So this bandwidth that we're uh, seeing now, this exponential decrease in, in uh, fiber optic bandwidth, means that I think we're going to the point that you will be able to have your own personal circuit from here to there. Now it may cost more than normal. You have, your personal computer is not free, but it is controllable by you, and then it can dissolve back into the great global set of fiber. Exactly. As we were talking, or as I made in my first early opening comments, we, we have the Optiputer project now, which is, is established, and we have Lambda Grid. Can you give us a little bit more definition on where Lambda Grid reaches, the speeds that it's under, and then after we define Optiputer and Lambda Grid, I'd like to go on to start to talk about camera, so people sure. can get a so, link of that. The fundamental point of the grid was, it was a set of middleware that allowed you to go out and essentially create momentarily an, a, a virtual computer that had pieces that were themselves computer. I call it a meta computer. So you go and get this Linux cluster in this city and that storage repository over there, you electronically put them together and then for the moment that seems to you to be at your own computer and that's what the grid does. But it was always over the best effort internet, which was this shared medium. And what the Lambda grid does, a Lambda is the term for one of these individual paths down the fiber that's one or 10 gigabits, is it allows you to go out and find an unused lane on one of these fibers, um, discover it, reserve it, then link it up as a rock solid basis for this middleware to run on. And so the grid becomes a Lambda grid. If you think about building this grid and then all the stuff on top of it, including web services, and it's sitting on, the, on this completely unpredictable physical layer of the internet, that's like building a skyscraper on the ocean. <laughs> so what the Lambda grid program does is build it on this rock solid base of the there's no jitter in a Lambda. It's exactly fixed latency. You don't have to use protocols like TCP that were developed for congested networks. You can put much more advanced protocols in. Um, and the Optiputer is the National Science Foundation project, a research project in computer science that I'm principal investigator on, um, that has many institutions and companies that are associated with it that are trying to figure out how to do that in a way that um, uh, individuals in their laboratories with their Linux clusters uh, can essentially turn those Linux clusters into the telephone, which, you know, telephone is a, a device that terminates the telephone infrastructure. The Linux cluster and tile visualization walls like you'll see tonight are the appropriate um, device to terminate the Lambda grid. When, when you're picking and choosing resources to generate your instances of the Optiputer, you said academic institutions, you said companies. I'm, I'm kind of surprised because we'd never talked about companies uh, uh, contributing resources to the Optiputer before, so I'm interested in right. hearing a little bit about that. Academic institutions, are these primarily uh, Western, or are they all over the world? All over the world. Um, so the Optiputer originally, the main, um, campuses were the University of California, San Diego, and Irvine, um, uh, plus USC and San Diego State and, the, and the Southern California, and then the University of Illinois in Chicago uh, and Northwestern um, were, that was where most of the resources were done, and a lot of the development was done in Illinois. But now we have Optiputer partners in Amsterdam, in uh, uh, KISTI in Korea, AIST in Japan, Taiwan was just talking to us, and, and Australia is, is developing uh, endpoints and so forth. And, and, and so what that means is you can have, with these large channels, you can have HD streams to be your major data object. So high definition video, which might come out of a camera at one and a half gigabits a second, uh, if you have to, you know, to, you compress that down to about 20 megabits a second to get it to the home. So that's 100 to one. <laughs> You know, 50 to 1. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, what we do is just leave it uncompressed because if you've got a 10 gigabit pipe, you can put a bunch of HDs in there, no problem. The re reason that's good is if you're compressing and decompressing, that adds latency. And if you're trying to do it for communication synchronously, you can't afford tenths of a second because then lip sync starts going and stuff like this, and people don't like that. So, what we're trying to understand is in a bandwidth, in, in a 
infinite bandwidth world, what would you do differently? And that's what we're really trying to, to understand at Cal IT2. Now the other thing um, that we haven't talked about is that this is the backplane of the global grid. The sort of things that Paul Jacobs was talking about, Qualcomm was actually Cal IT2's first industrial sponsor, very large uh, supporting uh, company. Um, all, all of this is being fed by this enormously growing wireless world, which is putting not just cell phones, but putting sensors throughout the world. And the thing that is going to be very different five or ten years from now is that we don't know anything about our world. I mean, how can you manage the world if you don't know its current state and its current rate of change? That's basic physics. But to do that, you need to know the temperature, the density, the pressure, the biological component, the chemical component throughout the land, the air, the sea, and that, that is, those bits are flowing worldwide and that people can have access to those bits, both to bring into supercomputers to do simulations and to do what ifs, <coughs> but also to be able to make decisions, knowledge-informed decisions. Wouldn't that be a change? There was a, the lead up so far, we've been talking about capacity, we've been talking about networks, we've been talking about uh, meta computers and things like that, and that, that's a perfect lead into what I wanted to talk about next, was basically the subject of your camera paper. Uh, I really want to hear, they laid out four, uh, four phases of the camera paper, and I'd like to go through those. The one thing that, being a database uh, a geek, I was, I was very stuck on phase one, building and combining the, uh, the genomics data from the Craig Venter Institute, the DOE efforts, and then the uh, efforts in a number of other areas around microbial modeling and things like that. So, uh, for my own personal benefit, I'd like to hear a lot about that, but I do want to get through all four phases as well. Well, let me back up a little bit. For those of you who haven't read the paper and SNS, a special letter, um, one of the things I've come to realize is how little we know about the biological sphere on this planet. Um, first of all, the planet's, you know, three quarters water. And of that, the base of the food chain and the thing that drives the creation of oxygen so that we have something to breathe uh, is the microbial uh, bacterial and uh, phytoplankton level uh, in the oceans. It turns out that we know next to nothing about the actual biodiversity genetically of that. And so what Craig Venner, who drove the human genome from Solera from the private side did, is he's uh, realized that using the shotgun sequencing techniques that were developed for the human genome, you can go into an area of the ocean, essentially take a bucket of water, filter out the bacteria, take those shotgun sequence, the several thousand species that live together at one spot, and get back from this a vast amount of genomic data that we don't know about. And the reason that's important is life has been on this planet for about three and a half billion years. Multicellular life has been here for about half a billion years. So most of the experiments that nature has made evolutionarily in which the genes adapt to changes in environments and record in the DNA for billions of years what those responses were, that information by and large is unknown. And so when Venner went around the world every 200 miles doing this, he created a vast new set of data which um, the Moore Foundation, this is from Gordon Moore who was the founder of Intel, uh, they funded our institute to uh, work with the Venner Institute in Maryland uh, and to take that data, create a new generation of science data servers that recognize the coming existence of this national lambda rail and put that out there with the full genomic uh, data of these microbial ecologies, but also the environmental data in which those gen genomes are the answer, <laughs> right? So the way this works is that if you just have the genome, what's it the answer to? What, what, what environmental uh, situation is it optimal for? If you don't have both sides of the coin, environment and genomics, 
you don't really have the full science story, and that's why they call it metagenomics. So we're now building, we first got a chance to architect from scratch. What would be a 21st century data server for this kind of complex data, and how would we make it so that it could be communicated to people anywhere in the world using these new uh, dedicated light pipes? Did, did you have any clue that it would be genomics, would be the use of this, these supercomputers when you started building them back at the NCSA? Absolutely not. Um, I think the thing that is really most surprising to me, and I'm an old physicist, an astrophysicist actually, so I was used to simulating, you know, um, supernovas and black hole collisions and solving Einstein's equations of general relativity and things like that. Um, we just figured that's what supercomputers were for. And then these biologists come along, you know, in the 90s they started, and then it's, it's just been exponentially growing. And, you know, we said, well, biologists has a squishy stuff. What, 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 you know, what, what, why would they want a supercomputer? Well, <laughs> Of course, if you now take this, I mean, your, your genome is three billion characters long. And now imagine you start looking at the variation in the human genome, and you want to start looking at all against all comparisons. But now imagine that you say, well, let's just look at all life. Let's just assume we have the genome of every living creature on Earth, and we start comparing and looking for patterns. There's no supercomputer around that's powerful enough for that. Exactly. So we, we've got the platform in the Lambda grid, the Terra grid, the Optiputer. Camera is the first application that, it, that is being funded. Well, and the thing that's really interesting is that it's not just uh, an a application of this worldwide optical grid, but it will also be the first persistent collaboratory. So one of the things that I think is really emerging as a killer application is the elimination of distance. Um, we, will, we, are, we have now constructed a 10 gigabit dedicated open pipe um, from uh, San Diego to the Venner Institute in Maryland. We prototyped this with the Goddard Space Flight Center last August. Um, and so what this means is we have, imagine there's just a great big plasma screen and it's a window in Cal IT2 and in through the window is the Venner Institute. And it's just on 24-7 because you've got these HD cameras that are just flowing back and forth. You're, as you'll see as night, you have these, we take these LCDs and make tiled walls that are like 50, 100 million, 200 million pixels in scale. And so you can begin to look at this vast array of data at both sides while you're talking to each other and effectively then you can bring into that conversation anybody anywhere in the world that's on this net. So it's not video conferencing, it's telepresence, and there's a huge psychological difference. Um, and, and this has been a holy grail of the people like at Xerox Park, John C. Lee Brown, and many of the others who have studied human collaboration for several decades, and it's always failed. Um, what we're trying to do now, and this is, I think, very important to bring in social and behavioral scientists from the beginning of these exercises, is the tech is now there to make distance disappear, to make it seem like the world is wormhole connected. And, and how are we going to live and work in that environment? And mm -hmm. that's a human factor, psychology sort of exercise. It's not a tech exercise. Exactly. Well, one of the things that, that you asserted in your uh, paper on camera was that this would have impact for uh, global medicine. This would have impact for science. This would have impact on alternative energy and how they're discovered, how they're developed, how they're used. Right. Where are we from a development perspective to where camera starts to spin off some of these additional benefits? What's the timeline? Right. Well, camera, you know, is really just going to be the place where this global survey of biodiversity occurs. Um, already companies are, um, biotech companies are going back to the ocean, um, getting their own sequences, um, and then looking for uh, possible uh, anti-cancer drugs, uh, uh, looking at uh, one of the things that uh, Synthetic Genomics, which is Craig Venner's a new company, is doing is, you know, you, you look at places where cellulose is decomposed by microbes um, uh, and under mangrove swamps and stuff where there's a huge load of cellulose that has to get, you know, dissolved and back, made back into, into the fundamental elements. Well, that means those microbes have genes 
which have been evolved by nature to be extremely efficient at getting rid of cellulose and turning out, say, ethanol. And, and so there's a whole set of startup companies that VCs are funding and so forth now that are saying, well, if we could take those, those inventions that nature has made and learn how to use them industrially, that there's almost like a new industrial revolution coming based on the knowledge we discover in the genome of these microbes that have been evolved for one or another very extreme environment. And so the ethanol, I think, is the first alternate energy approach. Um, you know, in humans, uh, you have a protein called kinase, and there are about 500 different ones of these. They do cell signaling and cell switching. Um, about 2% of the human genome is in these kinases. Um, they are associated with many of the diseases, a lot of them with cancer, with, with uh, uh, cardiovascular diseases, uh, uh, kidney failure, and so forth, when the switch sort of gets turned on and can't get turned off. So it's 500 of these. Well, in this microbial survey, there are 17,000 new kinases that have been discovered. <laughs> and so, like, it's gonna take a while for the basic science that Mark was talking about you know, I mean, this is like this, it's, it's a lot like when Howard Carter looked through the little hole and saw all the gold in Tuckton Common's tomb, and he said, there's a lot, there's somebody wonderful here. This, the vastness of the data that is going to come from this uh, global ocean sampling, which is just a start. I mean, it's a guy going around with a bucket, you know. <laughs> I mean, come on. Um, and, uh, you know, there's so much unknown that, is there in these experiments nature has done. And then the clever entrepreneurs will be the ones who take those pieces of knowledge in one or another little niche and then turn that into a practical result. Okay. We've got uh, two more minutes left, and uh, I, I think I might run this right through without question since we're going to the Cal IT, IT2 facility tonight. I've been approached by a number of people uh, asking, well, should I go to dinner or should I go to the tour at Cal IT2? So let's hear about why you should go to Cal IT2. Well, it's really cool that our mission is to live in the future. And so that's what we're trying to do. And so you'll see tonight examples of, for instance, the first uh, digital cinema projector that is 4,000 lines across instead of the 1,000 or, or 1,500 that you're used to on your PC. It's post-photographic realistic. Um, you'll see 100 million pixel display walls. You'll see one of the most advanced photonic laboratories in the country. Um, and you'll see the camera uh, complex. Uh, and actually computer games, which we haven't talked about. Uh, Paul mentioned, uh, Paul Jacobs mentioned this is driving most of the, uh, uh, you know, if you take hundreds of millions of phones that have Java on them, the most downloaded applications are computer games. And so this idea of the world moving through computer games, uh, we have a major group working on that, and you'll see uh, our game laboratory, and you'll also experience some of the uh, uh, spatially digitized audio, the ability to begin to manipulate audio the way we think of manipulating images is a, is a really major uh, aspect. So you'll, you know, these are just a few glimpses of the future that, that you'll be able to share. Great. Well, that's fantastic. We're down to 10 seconds, and as always, every interaction I have with you, Larry, is mind-bending, and this included. So thank you very much.